So I, I don't know if you know, and it's sometimes, it's sometimes hard to, to keep it in your mind, but there's a war on. All of you super spiritual guys are thinking, yes, we need to fight Satan. Now I'm talking about the Russian-Ukraine war. It's true, because we so far south, we forget about it, but there's actually a war of life and death going on, and it feels almost like, uh, you know, when it started, I felt like, I felt like a bit like it, what it must have felt like in 1939 to see the, to, to, to hear about these reports of this war. Apparently, the Ukrainians had been, been, been beaten back a lot in the last two weeks, but they've just launched a counterattack and started to regain some territory. But what it made me think about is the world war. Um, my dad often spoke of it, although he was born during the war. So he, but it's, the, the Second World War was one of the biggest events that's ever happened in human history. And so I, I wanted to talk a bit about that because I, I think it'll help us understand what I'm going to be preaching about. So stay tuned. I'm going to, I want to run you through some things in, in the World War II, and then we're going to go into the Word, and I'm going to explain to you because I think that there's a very similar pattern in the Word. So to, I don't know how many of you saw Pro Saving Private Ryan. Um, the first 40 minutes of that movie were crazy. I actually, I, actually, I actually watched it with someone who had spent a good deal, deal of time in war, and he was like, wow, that was awesome. Um, it was, to me, the, the most vivid memory, and if you squeamish, shut your ears right now. I'm being serious. To me, the most vivid memory was when the guy walked past carrying his arm. I don't know if you guys remember that, but uh, you, you know you watch movies and you don't remember many much stuff, especially that long ago. But a man carrying his arm, arm made an impression on me. And so the landing at Normandy was one of the greatest events in human history. Basically, they ha you see those cliffs, they had to go through the water while the Germans were sitting in concrete bunkers and shooting at them, and they had to climb those cliffs. Basically, they were sitting ducks. And the reason they made it is because, they, A, they planned it very cleverly. They, they, they sent the Germans off on a wild goose chase. They planted, a, they planted plans on a, on a cadaver. They found a dead body, and they dressed him up in a uniform, and they sent him, and they let him wash up in Spain. And then they found these plans. It looked like they were, going to, they were going to land at Calais, but they ended up landing at Normandy. You see, and you see the, the human cost of, of, of what they had to do to land at Normandy. And if you, you see the full extent of this landing, they had to get 160,000 people to land on a few beaches. Can you imagine the planning, the thinking that went on, on there? Now, the reason why they had to pull off this incredible landing was because, of course, they had been driven out of Europe. Germany, Germany was completely in control of Europe. And, and um, one of the, the other great remarkable events of human history was Dunkirk. They had 338,000 men sitting on a beach. And for some reason, the Germans held off. And people, people rode across in rowing boats and fetched people. There was, they, in a week, they evacuated 338,000 people. If the Germans hadn't come, had come at that stage, they'd almost certainly have won the Second World War. It was an act of, it was, it was God intervening in human history to hold the Germans off. And so, in, by 1943, the Germans held the whole of Europe. They controlled basically the, the whole of Europe, as you can see there. 
I don't know what that second dot is in the middle, white dot in the middle of Europe. But the bottom line is, is that they control the whole of Europe. And the German, the, the Nazis were some of the most evil men to ever walk the face of the planet. You say, well, surely they're the most evil. Sadly, they have a lot of competition. I'm not trying to... <laughs> I'm, not trying, I'm not trying to say the Nazis were good in any way. They were evil, evil, evil. But I can show you a number of other empires that were just as evil. Like the Ninevites, who used to peel the skin off their, their enemies alive and stuff like that. The, the, the level of evilness in our world beggars belief. But because of N Normandy, because of this landing, by 1945, within a year of the landing, Germany no, no longer controlled, the Nazis no longer controlled any part of Europe. Last fact I want to give you is this. Even though Normandy, in a, even though Dunkirk seemed like a defeat, even though it seemed like a terrible defeat, do you know what they did? As soon as they landed back in England, they started planning the invasion. They started planning Normandy and how to get back the second that they had lost. And this is why, what I want to show you, because it's, you know, we speak about the supernatural realm, and um, a New Living Translation translates it as the unseen realm quite a bit, and I think it's a good way of, of putting it. But it's hard for us to imagine the unseen realm. And so I wanted to give you this, this picture in your mind as I, as I take you through what, what happened so let's start off um, with in, in Genesis 9 verse 1, and, it, and there um, it says, Then God blessed Noah and his sons and told them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. This was exactly the same instruction that God had given um, Adam and Eve. Go and fill the earth, replenish the earth. But what was... What was the humankind's response to God's instructions? They, they're in, what they did is, and let's look at Genesis 11, verse 4 to 5. It says, Then they said, Come, let's build a great city for ourselves with a tower that reaches into the sky. This will make us famous and keep us from being scattered all over the world. So what did God, had God said? Scatter. Go fill up the world. And in direct rebellion, they say, we are going to keep ourselves together. We are going to disobey God. We're going to build a tower that will make us floodproof. And God cannot tell us what to do. It's one of the great rebellions against you in human history. It was an utter, complete, and total rejection of God. It was a rejection of God. It was total, utter rejection, a repudiation of God. And I don't know if you remember two or three weeks ago, I spoke about Abraham and why God chose Abraham. It's because for Abraham was the first man in about 200 years to listen to God. They rejected God. They repudiated God. And eventually there's a guy that came along called Abraham. And... And so we need to see, because a lot of the th think, oh, you, a lot of us think, oh, um, Tower of Babel, cute story, languages. We don't get the pure evil that was behind what happened here. We don't grasp it. We don't grasp the level of rejection, repudiation of God. It was, it was literally they were sticking a, up a finger at God. They just called it the Tower of Babel. And, um, and, and so, and interestingly enough, Alexander the Great records when he went past Babel, he actually records seeing the tower. So um, 
but the Lord came, and, and so the Lord came down to look at the city and the tower that the people were building. And, and the response to this rebellion is the following. Why did the men and women repudiated God? So Deuteronomy 4 verse 19 to 20 tells us, and it says, and do not look up into the sky to worship, the, this is instructions to Israel, don't look up to the sky to worship the sun, moon, or stars. The Lord may permit other nations to get away with this, but not you. So the other nations were looking up to the sun, moon, and stars um, to worship them instead of God. They'd repudiated them. There's, there's, there's possibilities, and I can't say for sure, but there's possibilities that the Tower of Babel was connected to astrology, the worship and the belief that the sun, moon, and stars were in charge of their lives. And it says, the Lord rescued you from prison, Egypt, to be his special people, his own inheritance. This is what you are today. So what happened was, was that the rest of the nations repudiated God, pushed God away, rebelled against him, but God, through Israel, kept his name on the earth. Now, and, and so we, we see, um, and I've, I've been preaching quite a bit about this, but in um, Deuteronomy 32, verse 8 to 9, it says, When the Most High assigned lands to the nations, when he divided up the human race, he established the boundaries of the people according to the number of his heavenly court. For the people of Israel belong to the Lord. Jacob is his special possession. And so what happened is, is that God in response, and we saw last week that, that Paul says that the reason God did this was to, he handed them over to these spirits that, and the, these supernatural beings that they'd been worshiping, the sun, moon, and stars, the, the heavenly hosts. And he said, well, if you want to worship them, go off and worship them and live out the consequences. Because one of the, sadly, one of the things that the, the, the chief way that you, humans learn is through consequences. Don't touch that hot stove. Why? Ow! <laughs> you know, am I right? Anyone who's had kids knows that, that, that kids learn best from consequences. And so God handed over the earth, the nations of the earth, to, to their consequences. But... But I want to show you that that wasn't the end of the story. And so as soon as the whole earth had repudiated God, what did God do? He went and looked for a man, and he, but, and he found Abram. And Genesis 12, 1 to 3 says, The Lord said to Abram, Leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I'll bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. All the nations of the earth will be blessed through you. So just like... The allies, when they were driven out of Europe, they immediately started putting together a plan to come back. In the same way, God already had a plan in place, and he, and he started the fight back. He handed the nations over so that they could feel the consequences of the actions, and he picked a guy that would be able to bless the nations because, of course, he knew the supernatural beings that he had handed them over to would not bless the nations. And so he put a man to show who God was, uh, 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 that God doesn't want to oppress the nations. He wants to bless them. And so he got this guy, Abraham, and Abraham was the start of the fight back. But the fight back didn't really take root until much later. But, but God then start, put together an invasion plan to come back and start to touch the nations. And I want to show you, the first thing that he did was the, that he instituted Passover. 
where a lamb was slaughtered for the nation of Israel. And so, and this, this is a representation of Jesus dying on the cross and the lamb, the, the whole lamb had to be eaten. It was a picture of what Jesus was going to do. And the Passover was a rehearsal for Jesus coming. And so I went and, and had a look, and it, it looks like Passover was celebrated somewhere between 1,200 and 1,300 times before Jesus came. Now, who year, who, who year has ever been in a play? Thank you. How many of you rehearsed somewhere between 1,200 and 1,300 times? You've never heard of an event that was rehearsed that many times. Am I right? Guys, plays, can you imagine rehearsing 1,200 to 1,300 times? This was, the, the first step was so that he could redeem the nations and he did it through the Passover lamb. And he got them to rehearse again and again and again and again. So that people, when Jesus came and he died, and they'd say, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the, of the world. John the Baptist saw it. But so many, even though they'd been rehearsed so many times, they were, a lot of them still failed. Maybe not, not enough legs were broken. Okay, that joke fell flat. But, <laughs> but the point is, is that, he, that the redemption act was rehearsed again and again before it happened so that when it happened, people would see there's the Lamb of God. He's lifted up and he sacrificed for my sin. But that wasn't the only event that God rehearsed again and again with his people. So let's read in Exodus 12 verse 4. So let's just confirm that, that um, the Passover was rehearsed again and again. Exodus 12 verse 14 says, This is a day to remember each year from generation to generation. You must celebrate it as a special festival to the Lord. This is a law for all time. So this... So, so the, the purpose of Passover was so that people would remember and then thereafter remember. So they would see, they would recognize that Jesus had, what Jesus was doing, and then secondly, do what? Recognize what he had done. So God put this rehearsal into place, but it wasn't the only event that he, that he did. Let's have a look. Exodus 34 verse 23 says, Three times each year, every man in Israel must appear before the sovereign, the Lord, the God of Israel. So the first was Passover. Who knows what the second was? Anyone? Well, let's read it. You must celebrate the festival of harvest with the first crop of the wheat harvest and celebrate the festival of the final harvest at the end of the harvest season. So there was Passover, and then you had to celebrate at the beginning of the harvest, and then at the end of the harvest. Now, what is, who here knows what the, that the festival at the beginning of the harvest is called? Well, in Hebrew, it's called Shavuot. Any apologies to any Hebrews, Hebrews here if I've murdered your language? But does anyone know what it's called in Greek? Pentecost. What are we celebrating today? Pentecost. So the second event that, that they had to practice again and again was for Pentecost. So, and let's see what, it, what Pentecost was. If you look, these are pictures of people celebrating Pentecost. What is Pentecost? It's a harvest festival. It signals the beginning of the harvest. So 
So God, so, 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 so God set up these, these festivals and he, he set up Pentecost to celebrate the beginning of the harvest. So when did the invasion start? When did the efforts to reap, go and catch the nations back start? It started in Pentecost. Pentecost was God's Normandy. It was the time when the fight back really, really started. From Abraham right through to Pentecost, well, Jesus' death, and I don't, that, that was the catalyst for the harvest. Because you couldn't take a harvest unless sins could be saved. But it was Pentecost where God went on the offensive. And his goal was to take back the nations. Let's quickly look at the, the third festival. It's called the Festival of Booths. And basically what people had to do is they build booths. And they still do it today, you can see. And they build ha little shacks. They look quite well made, though. But they, and they live outside for, I think, a week or something like that, the Feast of Booths. Now, what, what, what do they celebrate then? They celebrate the end of the harvest. And, it, and there, there's a strong connection to the, the second coming of Jesus in the Feast of Booths. They blow a trumpet and that starts it. And they celebrate for seven, I think it's seven days they celebrate, they live in these booths. And so, has that festival been fulfilled yet? No. Why? Because the harvest has not yet finished. The war is still on. We are still taking land back. We are still taking people back. We are still bringing in the nations. So let's, let's have a look here. So I want to show you to what extent Jesus thought in terms of harvests. So in Matthew um, 9, verse 35 to 38, this is, these are the verses that the Lord gave me when I put me in charge here at Word of Faith, um, took over as pastor. And it says, Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages of the that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom of God. And they healed every kind of disease and illness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He said to his disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his field. And this is Pentecost. Pentecost was when he sent workers, truly sent workers into his field to do what? To bring in the harvest. Why is there Pentecost? So that we could win the world for Jesus. So that we could, the nations that he had let go, his plan was to start to bring them back, people of every nation. And so we see in, in Acts 2, verse 4 to 5, Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm. God, whenever he pitches up in the Bible, almost always there's a windstorm. That's why we believe there's a revival in PE coming. And it filled <laughs> the house where they were sitting. Actually, there hasn't been much wind lately. We need to start getting <laughs> going. Then what looked like flames of tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and they began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. I want you to pick up two things. First of all, there was a group of, there was a group of, of people who were in one accord. What did God say about the people at Babel? They are in unity. Anything they can do that they want to, they can achieve. These guys were in one accord. They were in unity. Secondly, they were in the upper room, sort of a tower. 
maybe not as high as the Tower of Babel, but they were in an upper place. And thirdly, what happened at the Tower of Babel? They split up, God split up them all up into different languages. And you know what? They all come out speaking in different languages. Pentecost is where the defeat at Babel was reversed. It's the antithesis, the opposite, the anti-Babel. It's where Jesus, where God takes back, starts his process of taking back the nations. There's some people who believe that tongues is no longer valid. They haven't read their Bible. They don't understand that, that Babel, that Pentecost is the opposite of Babel. It's the reversal of Babel. Why on earth would God reverse Babel for a few, few hundred years and then stop? His goal is to completely, totally, and utterly reverse Babel. That's ba Pentecost was the opposite. Babel was the upside-down world. At Pentecost, he put everything the right way around. And so now, suddenly, where, where language had been a barrier to communicating with people, let's have a look. Acts 2, verse 7 to 11. They were completely amazed. How can this be? They exclaimed. These people are from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. So where the language had been a barrier where they couldn't understand each other, the opposite happened at Pentecost because it was a reversal. People couldn't understand each other. Suddenly the Holy Spirit comes and they, everyone can understand everyone. And then they, and here's the important thing. Here we are, Parthenians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, the province of Asia, Perga, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the areas of Libya around Cyrene. Now, why on earth does the writer go into all, all the places where people are from? Because in Genesis 10, he, God divided them into all the nations, and there are Jews from, every sing, from all of these nations suddenly here in Acts 2. So God let the nations go, and now he's bringing the nations back. Why? Through the power of speaking in tongues. Through the power of speaking in various languages. God is reversing, reversing these nations. Rebellion. He's got a plan to bring them back. And so it goes on. Visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, and we all hear these people speaking in our own language about the wonderful things God has done. Where before they'd repudiated God at the Tower of Babel, yeah, they spoke about the wonderful things God had done. It was a total, complete reversal. If Normandy was where everything was lost, sorry, if, if Dunkirk was where everything seemed lost, Normandy was the, the invasion back. Babel was where everything seemed lost. And Pentecost where, was where the fight back started. What The nations that had been lost. It was time for them to come back. Now very few of you have got Jewish blood in you or are Jewish. But the point is, is you are here. Why? Because of Pentecost. The fight back to get you back started all the way back then, and the harvest has not yet been completed. So, what was the purpose of Pentecost? Jesus told them, He said, they, they were asking about Israel, and God was like, Jesus was like, let's not worry about Israel. He says, and let me, please, let me be clear that. that we need to support Israel and pray for the, specifically the peace of Jerusalem. But he, they asked him, when is Jerusalem going to have its own country? And he replied, the Father alone has the authority to set these dates and times, and they are not for you to know. 
partly because it would take nearly 2,000 years, 1,900 years. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere, first in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So what is, what is Pentecost about? It's when you are given your weapons to start the fight back, to bring the kingdom of God to every part of the earth. It's about power. It's about getting power to start that fight back. Satan, you're not going to bully us anymore. We are, not going to, we are not going to allow the nations to rebel against you, against God. We, God has given us power to bring the nations back. And let me show you what the end of the harvest is in Romans 7 verse 9 to 10. After this, I saw a vast crowd too great to count from every nation and tribe and people and language. Where is this? This is the great crowd gathered at the throne. Standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb, they were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands and they were shouting with a great roar, Salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. This is the end result. Who's going to do this? Who's going to see that this happen? It's us. It's people that had to climb up those cliffs, take the shots, and recapture Europe from that evil empire. In the same way, yeah, who's going to bring, take the nations back from Satan? God's, uh, Satan says to God, I'm the God, to Jesus, he says, I'm the God of this world. Jesus doesn't fight with him. He accepts that. But Satan didn't know about Pentecost. He didn't know that for 1,200 years they had been rehearsing for an invasion, an invasion of the kingdom of God. And you know what? 2,000 years later, you're part of that invasion. That's why we want to see you filled with the Holy Spirit and fire because it's for you to take this into your work, into your family, into your, into your university, your school, your social circles, that people, that sick will be healed, hopefully death will be raised, the, the, de the dead will be raised. We've got a, We've got um, Brian Burton who is preaching at Faith Fellowship. And seven of his people in Phuket have raised people from the dead. You can do that too. You've got the power. That's what Pentecost was about, was giving each of the children of God, putting the weapons to win the war against Satan into your hands. This is the fight back. The fight back started 2,000 years ago at Pentecost and it continues through us. God wants to use you. He doesn't want you to just come to church and you need to come to church. He wants to use you to bring the nations back. Say, so, well, I, yeah, I'm ready Switzerland, slopes, here we come. Let's start with South Africa. Let's start with our nation. And let's take the nations of Africa and then the nations of the world. We can do it because we've got the power. And the invasion that God has planned, he planned for over a thousand years before he executed it because it was that important to him. God wants to use you. That's what Pentecost is about. I want to pray for you guys before we close. I want 
I want those who feel like the Holy Spirit's been speaking to them, and they want to be part of this fight back. They want to be part of the invading force. They want to be part of taking the nations back. I want you to stand up if you feel like the Holy Spirit's been speaking to you. And I'm I'm not going to bring you out here. I just want to pray for you. Please stand up if if the Holy Spirit has been speaking to you. Online, um, you can type, it's me. Quickly. Any, who's, who, who, who has the Holy Spirit been speaking to? Saying, I want to be part of that invading force. I want to be part of the fight back. I want to be part of those who bring the nations back. It's me, Lord. Use me. It's a statement to God. It's me. Use me. Okay, let's pray. Father, I ask you in the name of Jesus to give us a revelation of the intricate planning and determination you have to bring the nations back to you. I pray, Father, by your precious name that you're going to do a mighty work in these lives. I pray, Lord, that you will empower them. We release the power of God in all those who are standing. I pray, Father God, that you will today, you will, that that they will, the power will be imparted on them and the confidence and the faith to pray for the sick, pray for, to, to, to tell people about the kingdom of God. Use the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Help them, Father, in the name of Jesus. I bless them. I thank you for their commitment. I pray, Lord, that you will look down upon them and start to open opportunity after opportunity for them so that they see the kingdom of God come. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Okay, the last thing we need to do is we're going to pray, for, close in prayer, and of course we're going to pray for our streets because we are all about the fight back. We're all about taking back the nation. So let's, everyone, let's stand, and we're going to reach out to William Moffat and Lily Avenue. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray, Father, that you are going to touch these streets I pray, Lord, that your presence will be upon them. I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, we speak peace upon William Moffat and and Lily Avenue and upon our city. We speak peace upon it. Lord, let your glory come. Lord, I ask you to bring people as they drive past into the church. I pray, Lord, that they will be convicted of sin, and I pray that they'll be transformed. I bless this congregation. pray, Lord, that you're going to use them for your glory. And I pray, Father God, I pray, Father, that you're going to bless them indeed. Amen. Amen. Thank you for coming. Don't forget Jerome Liberty. Those tickets are selling out fast.